All right. Um, we now have our lightning talk block. I'm going to try and be as strict as possible. Don't get irritated if I do this. All that means is uh, I'm giving them a one minute warning. Um, yeah, I guess without further ado, wait, who did I say was first? And what was your name again? <laughs> Roland. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> let's uh, give a welcoming applause to our first speaker, Roland. So hello, everyone. My name is Roland. I'm going to talk about automatic repair of uninstallable PIP packages in Poetry Tunics. Uh, a short outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, an introduction, the purpose of this uh, project, what the process entails, and then how we do the error, hand the error handling for the uh, repair. Then some notes about uh, reaching out for the uh, to the community first. Conclusion, future work, and questions, but I think don't, we don't have time for questions. So what is uh, Poetry Tunics testing? It's a tool to find, very important to find, and fix uninstallable PIP packages using Poetry Tunics. And the main goal is to ensure that the top 8,000 most downloaded PIP packages are installable via uh, Poetry Tunics. Uh, so why? Um, uh, a large number of PIP packages are unusable with Poetry Tunics. So uh, Poetry Tunics has a mechanism for overrides. Uh, you, have, you can override the dependencies, you can override uh, yeah, different uh, things about how to build a, a, a Python uh, project with Poetry Tunics. And with this project, we automate the process of first finding the broken packages and then fixing them. So in this graph, uh, what we have is the unstillability and installability versus the popularity of uh, a certain PIP project. On the x-axis, we have the percentile of the popularity of that project. And then on the y-axis, we have how uh, the probability for that pro uh, project to be installable. So as you see, the most popular projects here close to uh, close to the y-axis are mostly in installable. But once you get to less and less popular projects, the installability goes to 0 0.8. So most of them are not installable, right? Uh, so what that the process entails, we get a list, a JSON file, of the most downloaded PIP packages. Then we attempt to install them with poetry add package, a package being the name of the package. Uh, if that succeeds, then we run Nix develop to check if everything uh, compiled from source. Then we capture what kind, kind of errors we get from that if that fails, and then we fix them. So we create the overrides into poetry to Nix. And yeah, the most common failure is uh, no module find. So the key insight into this is that Pareto comes to the rescue, and the two most common errors account for 95% uh, of all the uh, failures, installation failures. So if we fix those two errors, which are no module found errors, this is like 70% of all the errors. And another one is not having a hash for a Rust dependency. If you, if you fix those two errors, we get 95% uh, of all the uninstallable packages fixed. So how, we, how do we fix uh, what's the process? So we parse, it's very simple. We, we, as I said, we try Nix develop. If that fails, we get the error logs. Uh, we identify what type of error we get. And then we execute a heuristic to fix the, the error. And then we create the overrides for poetry to Nix. Uh, one note is that I think it's very important to reach to the community first, because we don't want to overwhelm the community with 2,000 unwanted PRs malformatted, so we validate the idea first with the community, and then we try to provide high quality PRs. Um, the PR, yeah, so the PRs have to take into account not just fixing the, the, the package, but also the, what is the commit message, including a test for every fixed package, and that's all. I think the, yeah, um, for, as a conclusion of future work, I think 
uh, we have to continue to submit fixes for packages. Uh, I think I discovered that for me it's very uh, useful Nix and Nix packages to you to do mining software to mine software repositories. And I think the next project is going to be finding undefined behavior in C and C++ uh, with Nix and Nix packages, um, overriding the C++ compiler, and then doing some symbolic execution to, to find undefined behavior. And that's all for me. Very nice. Five seconds to spare. All right. Um, sorry, I, I don't have your names. <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> let's welcome, who are you? Uh, I'm Nitin. <laughs> nice. Let's welcome Nitin. Uh, no, no questions, by the way. Mm -mm. All right, wait, let me uh, start, start the, the timer. timer. <laughs> Ah, all right, let's go. Hey, uh, I'm Nitin. I'm gonna talk about Python packaging with AI. Uh, this is a mandatory disclaimer for my employer. So uh, <laughs> I set out, set out with this goal to, to evaluate how well LLMs could generate Nix derivations for Python packages. To do this, I created an eval using the existing Python packages and, and Nix packages, and then I ran that eval against three experiments. So in the next few minutes, I'll talk about data analysis that I did of Nix packages, the methodology that I took to define my experiments, uh, results of those experiments, and then a look toward the future. So if you look at Nix packages, you see some standard Nix derivation. It's relatively flat like this, uh, easy to parse out. But you also have much more complex derivations like this. And I won't get into the complexity here, but I did want to look into the complexity of Python packages as a whole across Nix, Nix packages. So what I did is I parsed the uh, Python packages um, with TreeSitter. Uh, and I was looking particularly at the attributes. Um, and we see that there's roughly 670 attributes. A lot of them uh, occur exactly once or a few times. Uh, and then there's about 16 that are uh, pretty common. Um, so this gives us a good sense that a lot of these packages are going to be easier to generate. right? There's uh, a lot of one-offs, but um, the majority of them have some standard set of attributes. Uh, and if you look at the distribution of input counts versus asterisk counts, you see that it's pretty left heavy and there's a lot of packages in the, the easier side here. Uh, and this, this is an upset plot of three attributes for testing. So the, the PyTest check hook, the, the do check, and the Python imports check. On the left here, you see the number of packages that have these attributes enabled. And on the top here, you see various combinations of these attributes. So what we're interested in is these 3,000 packages here that have, that have all three of these tests. Uh, these attributes for testing. And so what I do is I define an eval as does the agent generate a Nix derivation that builds, passes the existing imports check, and then passes PyTest. And so I use these 3,000 existing packages to define this eval. And I also do this post-processing where I upsert a few attributes. I upsert meta, source, do check, and the PyTest check hook. And I do this so that these tests run regardless of the LLM generate output, right? The LLM could just say, let's, let's disable do check, and then the eval wouldn't run. So I upsert these things. And we're also not interested in the LLM's ability to generate a hash, because we can automatically infer the hash. Uh, for the results that I'm going to show, I simplified. I only ran on Python 3.11, only on Linux, and I tested with Claude 3.5 Sonnet. The experiments I ran were a zero-shot prompt, where I simply asked the model to generate a derivation with the package name and context, and not much more. I also tested with the Python project files in context. So I just put requirements.txt, pyproject.toml, uh, and a few other files that are relevant for packaging into the context window. And then finally, I tested a React style agent where I run a build, get the output, the failure message, and then put that into the context when I prompt the model again. Uh, and these are the results. Uh, for the zero shot experiment, there's a 16% pass rate. And as we mo add more context, uh, the results improved to 45% with the React style agent running for simply one iteration of feedback. Uh, the zero shot uh, results should be uh, interpreted as a baseline. They give us a sense of uh, how well the models may have memorized Nix packages, as well as a measure of uh, how easy this eval is. And we can look at the results before and after the knowledge cutoff, and we can see that certainly there's a decrease in performance after the cutoff. And we can also look at the pass rate as a function of our two measures of complexity. 
uh, the number of inputs that we have in our packages and the number of attributes that are in our packages. And we can see here that it's mostly these easier packages that the agent is able to generate correctly. Uh, and then I have a, a breakdown that I did based on uh, various string matching that uh, you can take a look at from the data I'm gonna, um, that I'm going to post. Uh, and looking toward the future, there's, there's some research work that could be done here about um, having some sort of eval that measures out of sample performance, out of sample of the model training set. Uh, and to improve, in part, improve performance here, just looking at the results and the failure messages, there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit here just with just prompt engineering of guiding the model to generate particular attributes. And for casting a wider net, one could do rag of historical failures. Uh, to deploy this, I would run it after Nix template or Nix init, which would generate uh, the hash and some other uh, data that can be um, extracted from the repo. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. I did a little bit of research, and our next speaker's name is Tom. <laughs> Your timer. Are you ready? Uh, I don't make Starts. this bigger for people. Yes. Excellent. Three, two, one, go. OK, so uh, this came from a, a little weird idea, because we noticed that uh, a lot of times people have uh, lock files. and well, we like lock files because we want everything reproducible and we want to be able to build them and process them and do things with them. And a lot of lock files uh, that we look at uh, are like look normal, they can be used, we can be parsed, we can bring them in, but there's a lot of them that you can't. And that really is bad because now like what do you do with them? How do you rip them apart? How do you use them? You might need like import from derivation. You need to start like using native tools to process them. So an example like you know Haskell or something, right? Being able to look at the the configurations. Um, so I was like, hey, like, how bad would it be to write a parser in Nix? Well, it turns out it's actually not all that much fun. You could do it. Uh, you could kind of go take some big file, some big string. You could rip it apart. Uh, but you end up with all sorts of various annoyances or problems or performance issues and things like that. Um, and then I randomly came across uh, something called uh, you know, pack rat parsers and like peg grammars. And I'm like, hey, this is kind of cool. And then when you start reading about the um, uh, about it, it starts saying that like it's something that's perfect for a lazy language to use. I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of cool. I happen to have one sitting around. The paper actually does this in Haskell, but I thought might as well try to implement it. So I'll kind of show you just something really dumb. Uh, basically, let's make that not so big. Kind of have a whole bunch of like resolvers and things to set up, like how I process rules. Um, this is mostly just copy paste out of the Haskell implementation from the paper, so there's really not much uh, creativity that uh, was required here. Um, but yeah, basically just kind of a bunch of various handlers, good stuff, nothing really complicated. Um, some of it's annoying, some of it's kind of takes like weird workarounds due to like Nix limitations. Um, regex is for speed, great, because we like those things. And finally, like why do all this work? So after you get all this stuff working, here's what I get to do. And this is the part that's fun. I get to like start to like define like handlers for like what do I do with things in terms of like when I, once I have these values in an AST, how do I output them? All right, there's some like defaults for that for how to do that. But now let's define an actual grammar using hopefully some somewhat of a syntax. I just kind of made this up as some way to do it. But I could start to define hey like what is white space? What's a null? What's a bool? What's a number? What's a string fragment? What are these things? Uh, we could skip the comment thing, but lists and sets and items. Um, if you actually like, look through this, you'll see that this is defining a grammar for JSON. So let's go take a look at JSON. OK, this thing is the JSON. Let's go see if we can parse it. Uh, cool. It like parsed correctly. Everything worked. Let's uh, prove that that actually is a thing. So let's like have, make it break. OK, now it broke. Great, doesn't parse anymore. But one thing that I always wanted in JSON is I always wanted comments. Wouldn't that be great if we had comments? Like, this is totally invalid JSON. Uh, but, you know, let's see if we can kind of get that working. Hey, now it works. And so, like, that's because we had a, uh, I defined essentially an extension to JSON that now understands that comments are a thing. 
and they exist, and they start with a hash, and they have a regex slurping up the rest of the string. Kind of a dumb example, but you can imagine now being able to define arbitrary grammars and being able to parse them, and that's kind of cool. So that's just kind of something that we put together. Um, yeah, there's problems with this in terms of like very large lock files. So uh, Nick still has a problem with if it's a really, really big uh, lock file, it's actually a quadratic uh, performance problem. Uh, Lix has this fixed because they're storing an extra like string length thing. We need to get something like that into the uh, Nix implementation as well. But other than that, uh, it's just kind of something fun, quirky, and interesting. Um, I don't know if it's useful yet, but it's fun. Okay. Okay, I guess we got 40 seconds for a quick question, maybe. <laughs> No, okay. Just I answered that. The question was why? The answer is because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Which type of fun, yeah? <laughs> right there. The Berlin fun, exactly. Berlin fun. There we go. Okay. That's it. The last 20 seconds, you, you can. You have a question. I can, okay, uh, quick, quick. How much Tons. memory does the parsing take? <laughs> Tons. Uh, actually, though, the PackRap parser is, is relatively good at this, and it is optimized. Ha! <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Please welcome our next speaker, Brian. Will this one work? It will. Nice. Is my time starting? Uh. <laughs> You can cheat? No, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to play it fair and square. Okay, I'm going to say three, two, one, go. Okay, so what I'd like to do with this talk is just get a bit of the fear of experimental features away. Because I honestly think that a lot of the experimental features are great, they're fun to use, and they're just like, if you play with them, they'll get stabilized quicker, at least, I hope. Um, when you look at my Nix config, or whenever colleagues ask me, ask me like, hey, can you sh uh, share me your Nix you know, code? Um, I can, but there's a chance that it uses an experimental feature because I enable pretty much all of them because I'm a freak like that. And I, I just like testing that out. Like, I like living in the hellfires. Um, and just a quick rant. I'm going to do four slides of a quick rant and then move on right, to do other cool experimental features. Uh, Flakes and Nix command, right? Um, it gives you very cool things. It gives you flakes. It gives you a lot more reproducibility. It gives you cool new commands. It gives you a cleaner interface. Just use it, right? Uh, I know it's called an experimental command, but by now, oh, wow, compression did this one dirty. Um, there's like 39K references of flake.nix and GitHub alone. So it's battle tested by this point. There's enough people testing it, and not that many people are complaining about it. However, the Nix team. Normally, normally, I address Ilko only, but I won't do that anymore. Can you just please stabilize it instead of constantly drawing 25 cards? You have enough cards by now, right? Um, often, jokes aside, um, I honestly think that there's one problem with it. Like, the, the experimental features right now are like the workflow, like how they get built, when they get stabilized, et cetera, they're defined by this. And I think we're quite good at all of it. Like, all of the top ones are, are fine. It's the bottom two. We never make a decision. We got stuck at like, should we remove this or should we stabilize it? Um, and I think it's the same problem with like long living branches or feature branches. It's the same problem. If you keep it around too long, if you keep it experimental for too long, it's going to rot. So let's make a decision. Let's just get it across. And that'll be the end of my rant. You had the flakes, you had the next command. There we go. On to cool stuff, impure derivations. I love impure derivations. It gives me this like, okay, Nix is this pure thing, it's this nice little ball, everything is nice and self-contained, but I, I can't really do anything outside of it. Whereas with, if, if you look at Haskell and if you look, look at you know, a lot of the uh, functional programming languages, you have this monad stuff that allows you to do like, some of the impure stuff that's well defined. This isn't quite that, but I treat it as such, and that I will use the impure derivations to do just the most unholy things when I need internet access. The minimal thing that I, Find up is that you so you do the underscore underscore impure equals true, and then you can just like access the internet. Um, that's also what it's kind of meant for. It's kind of meant to like fetch source trees and all of those things, and then actually get the hash. Blah 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 blah. Um, I just think they're cool. I think that there is a lot of unexplored possibilities there, and I think that's a lot of things we can do with it. But again, it's an experimental feature, so let's start using it. Let's start giving feedback, and let's actually make a decision if we put this in next or if we don't. 
Again, this is running it. You'll see I run the file. I access the internet, no problem. I get results back. Uh, if I had used a, a second kind of derivation, which the name is just escaping me because of the stage fright, um, I could have actually used this again in the pure world, kind of making like the onion layer that Haskell people like to call about, uh, talk about. It's kind of a similar thing. It's cool. Again, compression did it dirty, but the pipe operators, fairly new. Um, I have them enabled already, I love them, so I'm at this moment writing Nix code that probably nobody in this room, except for the ones that enabled the pipe operator experimental feature, can run. Um, why do I think it's cool? Like the RFC also mentions, if you have to read this code, you have to read it from the inside out. And that's just not intuitive to most people. Most people come from an imperative programming background, they read from left to right, top down, with Nix like this, yeah, you have to read from the inside out. That's just odd, right? When you enable the pipe operators, now all of a sudden you can just you read it from top to bottom without all too much trouble. I'll speed up. Recursive Nix, also just amazing. What if Nix could be able to call itself? Um, there you go. Build hello inside of a derivation and then output. It's as simple as possible example that I could come up with. Absolutely love it. Um, I could not get it to work actually this morning, so. Something broke. Local overlay store, again, an awesome feature. What if we took a Nix store, made it read only basically to the user or to the consumer, and then on top of that, put a write thing so that they can actually still write to it, but it doesn't destroy the underlying store. Amazing feature. And there's tons and tons and tons more experimental features that I'm not going to dive in because of time limit. But if you want to talk to me, I'd love to talk to you as well. We'll do crazy things together. About 10, 10 seconds, nah. I'm fine. All right, thank you very much. Let's welcome our next speaker who was responsible for giving us his computer, thank you, but he's also responsible for the redshift in the presentations, but I guess that's just our style today. Uh, let's welcome Shivaraj. I, All right, yeah. Uh, um, wait, wait, let me start the timer, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Ready? Yeah, yeah ready. Three. Two, one, go. All right, uh, brace yourselves, I have to speed run this. Um, okay, so what is, why does services fake exist? Uh, it's because it brings NixOS-like services uh, to your project, the, uh, project working directory, and instead of uh, having global data directory, you have it uh, in your project, and uh, yeah. And also we wanna uh, uh, support both macOS and Linux and run them natively. And uh, apart from that, you also wanna, we also wanted to run, uh, just Nix run the Flake anywhere and bring up the services um, with, with Process Compose. And then also share uh, service configurations. Uh, that is, you just write the configuration once and share it amongst your Flakes and also uh, within the same Flake to do different things. Yeah. Um, and there are also other nice stuff that it supports. Uh, for instance, you can run multiple uh, instances of Postgres. Uh, and if, if, if we use Flake parts by default, uh, but if you don't want to use Flake parts, uh, you can use a function that we export as well. And yeah, I, I think yeah, if, if all of that went over your head, I'll just do a quick demo. Um, so here we have a demo app that depends on Postgres, which is like a REST API front end for PostgreSQL. And before I, I show you the demo, uh, I just want you to like quickly think about this at some points, like how would you configure uh, the development environment to have these services? And also how would you use the same configuration uh, to um, uh, write integration tests? Uh, and uh, not, not use uh, TCP ports, that is use, use Unix socket for local development because that's when your uh, development environment is truly local to your project directory. And yeah, uh, let's just quickly look at it. Uh, this is the app, and uh, I just start up the services uh, with the Nix run command. It starts up services, and then I uh, uh, just watch on the project directory. Uh, it starts watching on the project directory, and I, all I do is now uh, just make the code change, and let's say I open a main file, and I make some change. Yeah, so let me just add some new lines after each task. And yeah, so it just reloads and it just works. And it's, it's as simple as that to set up your project. Um, yeah, and there are also other usage examples. Uh, so uh, Namayatri, which is an OSS alternative to Uber in India, uh, we use services like there. And there's also Hyperswitch, uh, which is an OSS payment switch, uh, which will also soon adopt uh, services flick. And yeah, and finally, I would like to thank all the contributors and also to the Debian project, which uh, inspired uh, this project. 
uh, yeah, and I will also be uh, open uh, to uh, focus on these things on Hack Day, especially the portable service layer. Uh, um, so basically, you can we are just tied to process compose right now, like NixOS is tied tied to systemd, and um, Nix Darwin is tied to launch D, tied to launch D. But um, imagine if you could just uh, use the uh, same options, but uh, you could configure the underlying backend however you want. So that's 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 portable service layer. And I I'm sure there are uh, many people who are here who can uh, who know how to do this better. But yeah, I have no clue. But I would love to talk to more people about this. Yeah. Uh, that's my time. Thank you. Oh, wow. That was a speed run. You got oh, wait. one minute and a half left. I, I think I missed something. Oh. You missed yeah. something. Yeah. If you want, you can get some questions. I, I was timing it like at least 10 times. And every time it was like six or seven minutes. Oh. I think it's a straight spread that, that made me do it this fast. Nice. So, yeah. well, <laughs> so you want to tell some jokes or something? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I'm already shit scared here. <laughs> Does someone want to shout a question? Yeah. Where's the oh, repo yeah. was asked? <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's here. Oh, hold on. Yeah. See, that, that's, uh, it's his computer, so that's the... <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> you get an unfair the, advantage the, here. The what? font is this too small? Yeah, I think. Yeah, this is the repo. Oh, is it too tiny? Yeah, so this is the repo. Oh, we also have good documentation if you want to start with. I, you, oh, I forgot to go through the Nix code. Yeah, that's what I... <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I can quickly show that. That's not a problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, all right. Uh, you so, got 30 seconds. Okay, yeah, I think that should be enough. Uh, okay, yeah, let me just zoom in on this. Uh, so if you look at uh, how we define the services, it's, this is the main part. You have Postgres here enabled, and you have Postgres enabled as well, and then you disable listening on TCP, and you also enable listening on uh, socket, uh, Unix socket, and then you load the, oh, sorry. Ten. Initial databases. <laughs> and uh, you see Postgres is imported here, but not Postgres. That's because Postgres is a custom Five. service. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, and I was talking about sharing configurations, so this is how we share and the configuration. And you This is ten more. No, 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 no. <laughs> Next time. Yeah, yeah, totally. That was awesome. <laughs> hey, wait, where's the last? Hey, where did you leave the last slide? Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Full screen, maybe? That ah, will be fine. Well, F does F11 work on? Uh, <laughs> it's, how does it work? Whatever. It's fine. Is it? Yeah, All works right. for me. So let's welcome uh, Arnold. Yep. Your time starts now. Right. So this is a lightning talk. So I'll try to be really fast and really controversial. Um, so if you disagree or are angry with me, then find me later. Uh, I love to talk about this stuff. Um, so I want to talk to you about why Nix is great for software freedom. So what is software freedom? Um, so there's free software and open source. And if you ask people what the difference is, some people say, oh, this is a very clear difference. Free software is the FSF, open source is the OSI. Free software is community, open source is corporate. Free software is copyleft, and open source is uh, permissive. Very easy. I completely disagree. So what is the definition? What defines free software? Well, if you look around, they talk about the four freedoms. They say, we want software that we can use for any purpose. We want to be able to study the source. We want to be able to share copies. And we want to be able to improve the project. And I love this. I, I want all of these. OK, then we look at the uh, criteria for open source. We have the open source definition. And if you look at it, it's got more bullet points, but it's basically saying the same thing. And that's not very strange, because the open source definition is based on the free soft Debian free software guidelines. So there's a lot of like shared history and stuff there. So am I saying there's no difference between free software and open source? No, of course not. There is a difference, but it's more in intention. So free software is more if you care about the public interest. Open source is more if you just want the best way to write software. So this is like a lot more vague and fuzzy, and sometimes you're like 
free software today and open source tomorrow. Um, but the nice thing is that Nix is great for both of these interpretations. Um, so let's look at this definition again. Okay, you study, share, and proof. Great, I want all of these. But they don't tell me anything about why you, want, you would want these things. And if you ask me why I want these things, is because I hate the gap between developers and users. Like as developers uh, uh, and, and users, I want to feel uh, I want users to feel empowered to make changes to make the software work for them. And if there's a gap between users and developers, that doesn't work. So I want there to be a gradient between users and developers. I don't want everyone to learn to code, but you should be able to talk to someone who can look at the uh, uh, source, maybe uh, figure out your problem, write, write a proper pull, uh, a pull request or a bug report. So I think that is really valuable, and for me, that is the point of both open source and free software. So you will read Floss has one. Like, depending on what, which research you, you uh, read, Floss is everywhere, it runs the internet, uh, all the proprietary software is chock full of open source software. So great, we won. Except we haven't bridged the gap. Like, there's a lot of users who don't feel empowered at all if the software doesn't do what they want to do. Um, so for the remainder of this talk, I want to highlight three barriers that I think uh, make the gap hard to bridge and how Nix help bridge those barriers. First is versions. If the users are on version 5 and the developers are on ver version 10, it makes it really hard to talk to each other. So why, why aren't the users on version 10? Well, if you're on the bleeding at, at, edge uh, version, it will eat your data and it will break your system. So that sucks. So we get, we're giving users no real choice. Now, the great thing of NixOS is that it might, running bleeding edge versions uh, on Nix, you might be running unstable, or you might be running stable but getting a few packages from unstable. This is a lot more possible and a lot less likely to break your system. It might still eat your data. You still want to do backups. Um, but I think this is a complete superpower of Nix, that you can, can, can pick and choose the latest versions of the things that you really care about. <coughs> Barrier two are binaries. So if I use some software in binary form and it's technically open source, that doesn't help me at all. If I uh, want to make a tweak to it and I have to download all the build prerequisites and maybe those prerequisites conflict with the other stuff on my computer, so I might even break my computer trying to edit this, uh, uh, tweak this piece of software, it doesn't help me in practice. So that's why it's a superpower, a superpower in Nix uh, to be able to build from source. Third is complexity. Now, Nix can be pretty hard to use for some people. Ten. On, the, on the other hand, it gives us superpowers because it makes it much easier to deploy stuff. Um, so I think Nix is amazing for software freedom, and let's all use it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that was it. Let's uh, thank all of the speakers again, please.